That means that the count was picked up at uh, 7.34 so that the launch should come if there are no further delays exactly at 7.45 a.m., 10 minutes from now, 7.45, 7.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 10 minutes to uh, launch time. So many things could happen. That's why those who are knowledgeable, and there are 10,000 of them, the workers here at Cape Canaveral, uh, watch all of these manned launches, just our fourth one, uh, with considerable uh, trepidation. Confidence, perhaps, but also concern. The critical points, uh, of course, they could come any time now. That uh, big bird out there is loaded with 27,000 gallons of highly volatile uh, kerosene, RP-1 actually, a kerosene light fuel uh, substance. It, uh, it uh, uh, is, as I say, highly volatile. It is oxidized in the air by liquid oxygen, uh, which fills also that uh, large 65-foot uh, booster. Uh, it blasts off with 360,000 pounds of thrust, and that's an awful lot of fire. Fire carried away from the tail of the booster by uh, a uh, great uh, tank into which the fire goes and is uh, carried away in a bath of water, causing the great burst of steam you see at the bottom of the rocket. Now eight minutes and 45 seconds before launch time. There is an automatic sensing and abort system, it's called, uh, which can uh, blast Scott Carpenter's capsule away from an exploding rocket. It works in 51 thousandths of a second. It reacts faster than a man would react touching a hot stove. Uh, and uh, it is intended to carry him away safely from the capsule in case anything goes wrong and an explosion is imminent. But it doesn't take hold until the rocket is some two to eight inches off the pad. Before that, uh, either the uh, astronaut himself or Mercury Control, the blockhouse, has to trigger that escape mechanism. But it's automatic after takeoff. It's now eight minutes until launch time. That is one critical moment, getting right off the pad. The next critical moment comes in 45 seconds after takeoff. That's at maximum stress. That's at the point uh, when uh, Mach 1, the speed of sound, is reached by this rocket. And at that point, uh, all of the stresses are on the great 97 feet of rocket, uh, booster 93 feet actually, of rocket and spacecraft and escape tower. And uh, it is the point at which uh, all of the knowledgeable men in Mercury Control hold their breath. Then at uh, 50 seconds to uh, uh, to uh, a few moments after that, a ground decision must come. Uh, Excuse me, that's not 50 seconds, it's five minutes. Five minutes after takeoff, after separation of the two booster engines, the sustainer engine package, 100 miles uh, uh, high altitude, 500 miles downrange from here. Well, the men in Mercury Control have just a few seconds to make a decision whether that 17,500 miles of speed has been attained in the right altitude, whether the keyhole, the bullseye in the sky has been hit, and the man can go into orbit. It's now 6 minutes and 45 seconds until launch time. If they decide that he cannot, they must give the signal quickly for him to uh, fire his retro rockets and to start a descent, because at the speed he's going, that descent still will come just off the coast of Africa, and if they delay any longer, he'd go down somewhere on the African continent. A land a landing can be made safely, but they prefer to come down at sea, and it's easier to find a man at sea than it might be in the jungles of Africa. Chris Kraft, the flight director, says that the odds are 200 to 1 uh, that the man will go into a safe orbit if any orbit at all is achieved. That is, uh, the odds are 200 to 1 against is going into such an orbit that he'd go too far out into space, perhaps not be recoverable. It's now 7 minutes to launch, 6 minutes to launch time. T minus 6 minutes. You see the uh, steam of the vents up by the capsule uh, carrying off venting uh, liquid oxygen uh, and the steam from the capsule itself. You see that little plume, uh, plume like a that from a knight's helmet. A knight perhaps not unlike that one who won his knighthood in 1622 uh, in England and was one of the ancestors of the man who sits aboard that rocket right now. 
the next critical moment in that flight that I was telling you about comes at one hour and 26 minutes. That's when the astronaut and the spacecraft are approaching the coast of lower uh, California, Mexico, and they have two minutes then to make a decision whether he should come back uh, after one orbit or not. If they don't make the decision in two minutes, they can't get him in the recovery area. Announcement now from Colonel Powers. This is Mercury Control. The countdown for the MA-7 launch is now T-minus five minutes and counting. On the basis of the present situation, the launch should occur at about 7.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. All elements of the Project Mercury operation have reported that they are in a go condition for the flight. The Atlas, the Aurora 7 spacecraft, the pilot Scott Carpenter, the launch team, the tracking network, the recovery forces, and now even the weatherman has given us a go. The countdown is now four minutes and 30 seconds and counting. Here are some things you might listen to here from Shorty Powers as he reports back from Mercury Control during the first few minutes of launch, and perhaps uh, that we may hear from the astronaut himself uh, by tape. Uh, these are on the basis of Glenn's reports and his flight on February the 20th. And it's four minutes now to launch T minus four minutes. Glenn reported that 13 seconds after launch that it was getting a little bumpy along here. That was that maximum stress beginning to build up. That's just 13 seconds after launch. At about 30 seconds after launch, somewhere between the 20 and 30 seconds in there, the Atlas should pitch over. That is, it rises vertically from the launch pad for uh, a, about a half minute. Until then, it begins its pitch over to hit its missile-like trajectory. Four minutes, three minutes, and 30 seconds. Three minutes and 30 seconds in the countdown now. That heavy maximum of force begins at 45 seconds after flight. That vibration becomes very strong at one minute after flight. Listen for those important points. At 1 minute and 12 seconds, the astronaut, if he follows Glenn's pattern, should begin to report that he's getting out of the vibration area. It's now T minus 3 minutes and counting, and, and, and now the A7 launch is now at T minus 3 minutes and counting. T minus 2 minutes and 53 seconds and counting. Less than 3 minutes before Scott Carpenter, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy, 37 years old, blasts off to make his historic ride into space. At 1 minute and 12 seconds, Carpenter should be getting out of that vibration area, and a great relief will go up here at Master Control at that point. Then at 1.26 or thereabouts, 1 minute and 26 seconds after he blasts off, he should be reporting on whether the cabin pressure is holding properly, and that's the next critical point. In about 10 seconds from now, we expect another announcement from Colonel Powers, and that announcement should say that it is T minus two, two minutes to launch. Let's listen. This is Mercury Control. The MA-7 countdown now is one minute and 50 seconds and counting. T minus one minute and 45 seconds and counting. I assume tensions growing around the world at the Grand Central, the scene you saw a moment ago as well as here at Cape Canaveral. One minute and 30 seconds now, 90 seconds before blast off. Four seconds before blast off, you'll see the engines ignite. The engines uh, are ignited, all of the engines, the two main boosters, 150,000 pounds thrust each. The sustainer engine of 60,000 pounds thrust and the two vernier engines of 1,000 pounds each. Uh, the Verniers uh, just keep the, the rocket steady in flight. The others are the big boost power. Uh, they all ignite simultaneously, a unique feature of the Atlas at four seconds before launch. Here's this is power. Mercury Control. Count is T minus one minute and counting. T minus 50 seconds now. T minus 45. T minus 40 seconds. 35 seconds before launch time. It's 30 seconds. There's still a ground haze here. 
the Atlas burns more fuel. Circuit control detects of all systems in the MA-7 Aurora 7 spacecraft. Indicate all systems are go at this time. Astronaut Carpenter reports he is in excellent condition. Electrical power is steady. Fuel supply is up. Oxygen supply is proper. The trajectory is still a okay. Maybe it looks good in another 15 or 20 seconds. We'll know whether he has achieved or better not. This is Mercury Control. We are four minutes and 55, 59 seconds, five minutes into the flight. All systems are go at this time. Carpenter now should be lifted slightly out of his seat as weightlessness sets in. He's reaching that 100 mile altitude. So we have a report here at Mercury Control that the sustainer engine has been cut off. The astronaut reports and confirms sustainer engine cut off. He reports capsule separation. We ought to hear, hear in a second. Mercury about Control it. reports that the mission is go. Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter reports a go at the point of insertion. That means that Scott Mercury Carpenter... Control has just advised him, Scott Carpenter, that on the basis of our computations here and telemetry indications, he is good for at least seven orbits. So M. Scott Carpenter, the second U.S. astronaut, is in orbit at this time. Oh, brother, we've done it again. We've done it again. Scott Carpenter is safely into orbit. That goal for uh, seven orbits simply means that, uh, that, that that is the maximum they calculate. He could go with no difficulties. There's no intention he goes that long. He Mercury would go three orbits. Scott Carpenter reports he is exercising his control system. He has made his turnaround, and the attitude control system seems to be working properly at this time. The flight surgeon reports his indications are that Scott Carpenter is in excellent condition in space. He has passed Bermuda now. He has turned around to orbit position, which is flying backwards and upright. He's sitting upright, tilted just a little bit down. It doesn't mean anything to him. He's weightless at this point. He has unstowed his camera. Astronaut M. Scott Carpenter aboard his Aurora 7 spacecraft reports that he's operating now on the fly-by-wire control system. He has maneuvered his spacecraft around and has uh, positioned the Atlas launch rocket so that it's in the center of his window as he looks out of it. This is Mercury Control. Fly-by-wire is the system by which the astronaut flies the capsule very much like one would fly an airplane. Uh, John Glenn had to fly by wire much of his flight because the automatic system uh, was not functioning properly. It is hoped, however, that is Mercury Control. At this time, we are transmitting uh, retro sequence times to the Aurora 7 spacecraft so that in the event emergency uh, develops here on this leg of the flight, he will be able to fire his retro rockets to land in a pre-planned landing area. This is Mercury Control. Besides the three recovery areas after each orbit, there are five pre-planned recovery areas scattered around the globe, contingency landing areas, and there is these to which uh, Scott Carpenter is now being given uh, the uh, checkout times. He is flying by wire, as you heard, controlling the the attitude of Mercury Control. We are now transmitting uh, emergency retro times to M. Scott Carpenter so that if some malfunction develops, he will be able to select a pre planned landing area. The ast astronaut, as you undoubtedly know, cannot control the path of his space capsule. That is controlled by the bullet that shoots him into space, the very reliable uh, Atlas rocket by General Dynamics, uh, that big rocket uh, is, determines in its speed and in its uh, degrees in which it is fired uh, the trajectory he will take in orbit. However, he can control whether the air capsule is on the right or on the back. broadcasting remotely at this time through our talking station at Bermuda. Mercury capsule communicator Gus Grissom is talking to the pilot, but it is being relayed through the Bermuda station. Some of our uh, reception from the capsule at this time is getting just a little bit noisy. That uh, 
uh, is not totally unexpected. John Glenn had the same trouble with the Bermuda reception. And in fact, was almost out of communication uh, about halfway across the Atlantic until he was picked up by the Canary Island Station, uh, which will be in contact with the capsule very shortly. Scott is expected to take his first blood pressure reading in about uh, two minutes. Up to now, he, if he's flying by wire, he may not be taking the first pictures that was hoped he would take from his 35 millimeter camera. It was uh, pre-planned that he would unstow that camera shortly after reaching orbit and then be prepared to take the weather pictures and ground control pictures that, uh, the, uh, that the scientists have asked him to take. He's due over the Canary Islands in a, another uh, four and a half minutes. An announcement now from Colonel Powers again. Roger, this is Mercury Control. We have lost effective voice communication with Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter at this time. And as he passed out of range of Bermuda, we did gather approximately six minutes of tape recording. The tape recordings are available now for playing. The sound you hear will be the voice of astronaut Scott Carpenter talking to the capsule communicator, Gus Grissom, here in Mercury Control after having passed the Bermuda tracking station. We're on the count. We're on the count. Ten, nine, eight, seven, Good. 
unofficial uh, calculation of his highest altitude and his lowest on this flight. His apogee, 143 miles. His perigee, his low point, which will be over uh, Texas, 86 miles, uh, which is the uh, lowest uh, orbited flight we have had yet. Uh, we'll give you more details in a moment. Here's Colonel Power. Contact with the Canary Island Station at 0800 Eastern Standard Time. He reports he is controlling the attitude of the spacecraft using the fly-by-wire system. He has, however, exercised the automatic control system, and it's very good. He reports that he is in good condition, and that all systems are working normally. His comment was that the Aurora 7 status was go in all respects. At the point of cutoff of the Atlas sustainer engine, the velocity of the Mercury spacecraft was 17,532 miles per hour. It was at an altitude of 99 miles, some 500 miles away from Cape Canaveral. On the basis of what we know now, we expect the apogee, that is the high point of the orbit, to be about 164 miles. The orbit is an, at an inclination of 32.5 degrees above the equator. The launch time once again, 7.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, astronaut Carpenter is in contact with the Canary Island Station at this time and reports all systems are go in all respects. This is Mercury Control. Well, that's a slightly different report on the apogee than we had had and sounds more reasonable. 164 miles for the apogee. Uh, Glenn's up to 162 miles, so this uh, would sound much more reasonable than 143, which would be very low indeed. And the perigee of 86 miles would be quite low. Uh, Glenn's was 100 miles, and uh, that is what Carpenter's flight had been programmed for. 86-mile uh, perigee was found almost dangerous, getting very close 
uh, to bringing uh, the uh, the capsule dipping back near the atmosphere where, of course, it could burn up. So presumably this new announcement of power supersedes the other uh, unofficial information we had, and 164 miles seems now to be the apogee. Very much the same as that of John Glenn. It will put... Uh, Carpenter's high spot uh, midway uh, over the Indian Ocean and his low spot midway over the continental United States. Uh, 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 he'll be in that same low spot. He actually hits it somewhere off the coast of California. We'll be back for more live coverage of Scott Carpenter's uh, historic flight after a pause for station identification. Back at Cape Canaveral, we're expecting an announcement from Shorty Powers, which probably will be that the retros fire at 32.34 on that clock. 4.32.34 is the time they should fire. Let's listen for Shorty Powers. of that shortly. He's 100 or 50, 200 miles off the coast of California and will begin his uh, slow descent back to the atmosphere and the uh, uh, and to the surface. He should make his landing. Uh, the predicted impact time will be around uh, 1240 Eastern Standard Time, about 22 minutes from now. Here's Shorty Power. Prepared for the retro firing sequence. Astronaut M. Scott Carpenter is reporting the firing of the retro rockets at this time. The retro rockets are firing at 12.18. This is country control. We have confirmation of the retro rocket firing of the Aurora 7 spacecraft. Astronaut Carpenter is in voice contact with Alan Shepard in our California tracking station. The retros apparently have fired properly and the reentry process has begun. This is Mercury Control. This is the last critical stage of Scott Carpenter's historic flight, three orbits around the Earth. Second to the liftoff itself, this yeah. is the most dangerous point of the entire flight. Oh, yeah. And there probably would be some who would say this is the most dangerous. At this moment, the capsule is dropping slowly out of orbit. It will come to reach the atmosphere at uh, about 4.43 in about nine more minutes. In nine minutes, it should be at, in the atmosphere. That would be 12.29 Eastern Standard Time. Those retro rockets, uh, three of them fire in sequence. Each firing lasts five, uh, lasts 12 seconds. They fire five seconds apart. So that the total process takes some 22 seconds uh, before all three are fired and they prepare to jettison the whole retro packet. It was this retro packet they decided not to jettison in the case of Glenn's flight in order to hold the heat shield on because of that false signal to the ground that the heat shield uh, might have come loose. Here's an announcement from Colonel Powers. Astronaut Scott Carpenter in the Aurora 7 is still in contact with Alan Shepard at the California station. He had encountered some difficulties with his automatic control system and is monitoring the uh, attitude control system fuel quantity very closely at this time. He and Alan Shepard are discussing the method that he will use to maintain the proper attitude as he re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. This is Mercury Control. The Aurora 7 is on its way down into its re-entry operation. 
You see that it's passed over San Diego, it's passing south of Yuma, Arizona, and over toward Phoenix and Tucson. It passes 25 miles south of Phoenix, a little north of this path shown on this simulated map because of the of the uh, angle from which the capsule is being shown. We do not know what this situation is with the attitude control system and the fuel consumption. Apparently, whenever uh, Scott Carpenter goes to uh, important and large maneuvers, the fuel consumption zooms goes a lot higher than it should. This is certainly only a layman's interpretation of it, but uh, when he is in normal flight and not doing much controlling, uh, he conserves a lot of fuel. As soon as he starts doing the important maneuvers, he loses a lot. Here comes uh, Colonel Powers again. Carol. Astronaut Scott Carpenter is still in contact with Alan Shepard in the California station. He has reported that his periscope did retract, and he is now about to assume the proper re-entry attitude. We established contact with our Guaymas tracking station at 12.22 Eastern Standard Time. This is Mercury Control. In 30 seconds, Carpenter has his next important maneuver. He brings the capsule to level flight uh, just before the re-entry. As he begins his long passage, over the great state of Texas, he is beginning to accumulate the information. He will report to the ground. He will get the detailed landing and reentry information from Cape Canaveral with the weather in the landing area, which we have heard is excellent, perfect weather, 800 miles southeast of Cape Canaveral here, where the aircraft carrier and and the two destroyers are standing by. The calculators are working now to predict his exact landing time and the exact point of impact. They're still worried about the fuel up there, suggesting that in all of his maneuvers and getting into his reentry attitude, he uses as little fuel as possible. Although he reported before he began these maneuvers that he had 40% fuel on manual, 45% still in automatic. That's uh, considerably above the minimums required, unless he is using a lot more in these maneuvers than we know about here. He's got about uh, four minutes before he enters the atmosphere. This is Mercury Control. Astronaut Scott Carpenter and the Aurora 7 spacecraft has now made contact with our tracking station in Texas at 12.24 Eastern Standard Time and is in fact passing across the lower portion of the United States about the northern border of Texas. He has been advised to assume re-entry attitude using maxim making maximum economy of fuel and exercise close surveillance of his attitude system. His fuel supply is low the attitude system is working, however. He is on fly-by-wire at this time. This is Mercury Control. He's about 50 miles north of Houston, Texas now. He should be getting his detailed predicted impact time and landing area in about a minute from Cape Canaveral. In two minutes and 45 seconds, he starts the capsule rolling. Uh, like a like a bullet uh, rolled by the rifling in a barrel and for the same purpose. With a slight roll of the capsule, he can keep it on its trajectory toward the target area uh, with less uh, uh, oscillation than he might get otherwise. He starts that capsule rolling uh, with his own maneuvers. miles south of New Orleans now, and you see this tense crowd at Grand Central Terminal in New York City, right at the middle of the lunch hour there, watching this re-entry. Here's Shorty Towers, Mercury Control. This is Mercury Control. The Aurora 7 spacecraft 
just made contact with the Cape Canaveral Communications Center. Astronaut Gus Grissom is in voice contact with Scott Carpenter in flight. The time of the contact was 12.26 Eastern Standard Time. The Aurora 7 spacecraft will encounter its densest atmosphere and highest G loadings off the east coast of the United States. At this time, the spacecraft is crossing the uh, Gulf of Mexico on its re-entry track. This is Mercury Control. He has about uh, two minutes and ten seconds before he starts the capsule rolling in the maneuver we mentioned a moment ago. He has two minutes and 30 seconds before he hits the maximum heat of the re-entry, 3,000 degrees, just three feet from his back at that heat shield. At the same time, the pressure of eight times his weight, nearly a half a ton, pressing into his body. His body weighs that much in that honeycomb fiberglass couch specially tailored to him to take the stress of that load. It's about equivalent to the same stress he felt in blasting off from Cape Canaveral. At the time he gets the maximum heat, he's about 50, going up still about 15,000 miles an hour and he's 25 miles high. capsule becomes, in effect, a meteor smashing toward the Earth in a flaming ball. He's protected by the insulation inside and the heat shield outside. He's starting the capsule rolling now if he's on time with his maneuvers. And he has about 20 seconds to that maximum heat point. He should be just about over Palm Beach when that happens. Ten seconds now. Five seconds. Maximum heat. The flaming ball of meteor should be this sensation at the moment. We have a report from... Here it is. Here it is. Mercury Control. Astronaut Scott Carpenter in the War 7 spacecraft reports that he has the horizon in view and has the balloon in view. We have advised him of the weather conditions in the recovery area. Uh, we find that there are four tenths cloud covers. The wave heights are two to three feet. The winds are eight knots in the recovery zone. He has now completed his re-entry checklist, during which time he secures all loose items in the cockpit and buttons up for that peak G during the re-entry. This is Mercury Control. According to the flight plan we have here, which has been uh, absolutely on target throughout the four hours and 45 minutes of this flight. And those announcements from Mercury Control are coming just a little bit behind the fact. According to our information, he is in that heat layer now. He goes to a speed reduction between 46 and 12 mile altitudes and a slant distance of 760 miles across the Gulf of Mexico and the Florida Peninsula that reduces the speed eventually from 17,500 miles an hour to just 1,350 miles an hour in just over three minutes. Here's powers again. This is Mercury Control. Astronaut Scott Carpenter has just reported that he has detected the buildup of the chief forces of reentry. Just after that communication, we lost our contact with him, which we expected to do. As the spacecraft comes into the atmosphere, a layer of ionized air builds up around its outside and prevents transmission of radio signals. We are tracking the spacecraft, but are not receiving signals from him. This is Mercury Control. As Colonel Powers says, this is expected. The ionosphere builds up around the ionization, builds up around the capsule and uh, prevents any radio transmission. We've had the same thing with Shepard, Grissom, Glenn, now with Carpenter. These are the tense moments when he's out of touch at the most dangerous phase of the trip. The first report from him should be that the gravity is building back, but he's back to normal weights, and that could come any moment now. He should have been through it by now. But these delays in communication, if that's what they are, indicate uh, that we should be hearing in just a moment. A 
upon re-entry. The time schedule that does sometimes get a little off because as soon as the atmosphere is approached, uh, all sorts of new calculations must be figured, uh, which cannot be as exact as some of the others. However, he should be well in the atmosphere now. The lack of communications powers reported to us indicates that. He should be in just about uh, 10 seconds. He should be hitting the 100,000 foot altitude safely through the most dangerous part of the trip uh, where his altitude meter, his altimeter takes over and he's able to judge his free fall. That free fall, if properly damped, uh, is not a serious matter. It's in the proper attitude and at 21,000 feet he automatically hits that drove parachute to bring him safely back to the surface of the water. No reports yet from Mercury Control. We should have them any moment. Nothing doing now but wait. There should be a report. down 800 miles southeast of Cape Canaveral. The aircraft carrier Intrepid, two destroyers. The weather down there, good for recovery. Four tenths cloud cover, which is a little more than is desired, but perfectly acceptable. Three foot waves, eight knot winds. We should be getting a report from Mercury Control now that Carpenter has reestablished communications. One thirty aircraft, our uh, four C one thirty aircraft with special radio equipment are circling the area, so that uh, he, he can uh, he can have communication. Here he is, Powers. Now, this is Mercury Control. We are still attempting to re-establish contact with the Aurora Seven spacecraft. We expect to establish contact momentarily. This is Mercury Control standing by. We are beginning to receive indications that perhaps he is triggering his transmitter. We expect to re-establish contact with the Aurora 7 spacecraft momentarily. He should be at the point now of, of uh, ejecting that drogue chute, that small uh, six-foot chute that slows him down to 170 miles an hour. They got to go at 21,000 feet. We should be hearing from that shortly. There's has been a delay in communications, apparently, though. We're standing by. Uh, so apparently the capsule did come through the uh, atmosphere 
and the flame area. All right. Uh, no communication, however. You heard Colonel Powers explain their theory as to why that the impact point is 200 miles over the mark uh, beyond the Intrepid and its two destroyers. Uh, they have sent aircraft out now to begin to contact uh, the astronaut. As soon as that rogue parachute is released, as Bernie Eisman reported to you a little while ago, uh, there is chaff uh, released, and uh, a radar pickup of that would indicate uh, that the drogue chute has, has uh, uh, ejected and give a fix as to what the line of fall is into the Atlantic. An aircraft uh, of a type aboard the Intrepid uh, could reach an area 200 miles away uh, within uh, uh, perhaps uh, 30 minutes, perhaps a little bit less than that, 25 minutes. It may be that long before we get any kind of a report on it, here comes Colonel Powers again. Well, it's not Carpenter. We feel at this time, however, that it is out of our range of broadcast and are in the process of diverting aircraft into the area. Still no communication from Scott Carpenter. The Air astronauts have the capability for developing communications relays as well as an SC-54 from the Air Force Air Rescue Service with a paramedic jump team aboard. This is Mercury Control. Scott Carpenter completed his three orbits, began his re-entry, and uh, we have not heard from him now since he entered uh, the atmosphere some 10 minutes ago. The report from Mercury Control, as you heard from Colonel Powers, is that he apparently has overshot his mark by some 200 miles, and that uh, the feeling, certainly the hope, in Mercury Control is that the failure to hear from him is solely because of the uh, lack of range of communication. However, this uh, seems to deny uh, the information we had before flight that he was uh, to get into communications with four C-130s, especially sent out with uh, receiving and transmitting equipment to avoid uh, any such uh, gap in communications. We have not heard that those four C-130s actually were on station, however, and uh, it is entirely possible that he is simply out of range. There's nothing to do now but wait. All of the communication services are on clear channels, calling Aurora 7, calling for Aurora 7, but uh, no answer is yet. The aircraft carrier Intrepid has very much the same capabilities as did the carrier Randolph, which was uh, the recovery, prime recovery vessel for the Glenn and other flights. She has uh, jet aircraft aboard and can presumably get aircraft over the predicted impact area within 20 minutes. As Colonel Powers reported a moment ago, paramedic teams are aboard other aircraft, which probably can't make it to the po that point as quickly as that. The recovery teams themselves, the recovery teams for the helicopter, for the capsule are helicopter-borne and it will be some time before they can reach the scene. Uh, they do not have a 200-mile capability. They will have to wait until the Intrepid can steam at her 20 knots or so uh, toward the scene, 20 miles an hour, 200 uh, miles, would obviously take her 10 hours to make the full distance, uh, something less than that, perhaps five hours, six hours before she could launch her helicopters. Considerations here now, waiting to hear the impact points for Scott Carpenter. The radiations are out of Bermuda. 
However, the key point is now nearly a thousand miles southeast of Cape Canaveral. The Intrepid and her recovery ships were in an area 800 miles southeast of here. And the information from Mercury Control is that the capsule overshot by 200 miles. So it'll be a thousand miles from here, 200 miles from the nearest recovery ship. throughout this three-orbit flight. First with the temperature in his suit, the first couple of orbits, and throughout with the supply of fuel in the capsule. Here comes an announcement from Mercury Control. This is Mercury Control. We are still working at establishing contact with the Aurora 7 spacecraft. On the basis of our computations at this time, we estimate the spacecraft has already landed, and we estimate that it has landed 200 miles long. We will not be able to confirm these times, however, until we get data. The aircraft, the nearest aircraft, is approximately 120 miles from the landing point of the spacecraft and is on the way to the scene at this time. It is an SC-54 Air Force rescue airplane with a team of paramedic rescue experts aboard. It is currently our plan to jump the rescue people on the scene near the spacecraft. This is Mercury Control. The plan to jump the paramedics onto the scene would seem to indicate that there is some concern in Mercury Control that communication will not be re-established with the spacecraft. Communication could be re-established with Aurora 7. Presumably, it could be decided whether uh, whether to leave the Scott Carpenter aboard or for him to egress. Let's go now to the outboard destroyer USS Pearson Delevingne. Pearson Delevingne, this fucking boat is really rolling right now, and what a happy crew we've got. Of course, there's no gangling in the Navy, but believe me, everybody's going to be collecting this tonight. So John out here, headed out, right to 32 knots. The light, the fire behind us, water breaking over the bow, and we're on our way. Of course, we hear some rumored reports about the possibility the Air Force may possibly get there ahead of us. Maybe so. But there isn't a man jack of more that will go along with it. The guy up here, on his way to pick up Commander Scott Carpenter and his flying machine. This is William Evenson, aboard the John Harris in the Atlantic Ocean, 1,000 and a little better miles southeast of Cape Canaveral, Florida. Well, it's just been an amazing day here at the we hope that there is every reason for Bill Evanson's optimism. That uh, is the best report we've had, that the uh, destroyer is, Pierce is well on its way toward the impact point. Apparently, they don't seem to think they're as far from it as the Mercury Control uh, facts and figures here, 200 miles would indicate. As a matter of fact, Evanson reports that he's already, that the Pierce study is already 1,000 miles from Cape Canaveral. And if that's true, it would put them not too far from the, uh, from the landing point of the capsule. Maybe things aren't quite as uh, dark as, uh, as the tension here seems to indicate. An aircraft, an SC-54 with paramedics in jump uh, gear and ready with rafts and other equipment uh, is on the way at 120 miles. That's not the fastest airplane in the world, but uh, it ought to be able to get there in 40 minutes or so. From this spot on the map is the general area of the search. That uh, big dot now is the predicted impact point. Not uh, too far as you see from Grand Turk, uh, the island and the facilities where the returning astronaut was expected to be taken. There is still no communication with the capsule. Evanson from the destroyer Pierce, that was the so-called outboard destroyer, and that means the destroyer farther out. Uh, and let, let's go to him now, Bill Evanson, out there on the Pierce. This is William Evanson aboard the John R. Pierce, the destroyer, now traveling at flight speed, 32 knots, and moving out into the Atlantic in the hopes of picking up Commander Scott Carpenter and the capsule. There's a wake behind us almost a mile long. 
According to all of the data that we can collect this time, we estimate that the Aurora 7 spacecraft would have landed at approximately 12.41 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, some 200 miles farther downrange than the original plan, originally planned landing point. There is a rescue aircraft 120 miles away from the landing point and has been diverted and is on its way. We estimate at this time that it will take approximately one hour for the aircraft to get to the immediate scene of the landing. We will continue to make efforts to make radio contact with the Aurora 7 spacecraft. In addition, we will continue to uh, analyze the situation and send rescue forces into the area. We are standing by in Mercury Control at this time. Well, with a 12.41 impact and the immediate dispatch of the rescue aircraft, can be anticipated that that rescue aircraft could be in the vicinity at 1.41, which is an awfully long time from now, perhaps for Scott Carpenter and for those who are waiting around the world for news of this successful recovery. As I was saying, he can leave that spacecraft either through the hatch, which he blows with the explosive charge that uh, rims the hatch cover, or he can leave through the neck of the aircraft, which is slightly more difficult. That requires removing the the, uh, the panel on the right-hand side, going up uh, through a, me, a very narrow neck. Up there in that neck, though, is the life raft, uh, which he can uh, jettison. Uh, the life raft has a boarding ramp on it, a low end, which make it possible for even an injured man to climb aboard, presumably. He has a plentiful supply of shark repellent and of, uh, of uh, knives and things of that sort. All communication channels are cleared, and every possible means is being made to contact the capsule, so far without success. Perhaps we could go out to St. Louis to Bob's seat if he's still in his capsule at McDonnell Aircraft, and Bob could show us uh, some of that egress technique. Bob, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Walter. Uh, Bob, what, what would he have to do to get out here? Uh, I think Bernie will have to work on this also. On the egress through the side hatch that you talked about, uh, this hatch is not on on the capsule we have here. However, he'd strike the uh, impact point of the explosive disconnect, and that hatch would leave. More likely, though, through the small end of the spacecraft, he'd make his exit by removing the right-hand side of the instrument panel. Bob, would you show us how it comes down uh, with that lever? Yes. Pull this lever up. And I think from here you can see that at this particular point, he can throw the handle, and this panel opens up into the cylindrical section on the small end of the spacecraft. And Bernie, I think you can show them how they come out at that point. Fine. Through that small channel, he would have to come out crawling head first uh, in a bare space for him to get through to come out this end of the spacecraft. Uh, one problem, Walter, as you're well aware of, when he does come out, and this is up in the water, as he goes up into the channel, the center of gravity of the spacecraft changes, and it starts to tilt over in the air. So he's got to get out of this pretty quickly once he gets into it. Otherwise, it goes over horizontally, starts shipping water through the hole, and uh, it can be uh, a mighty wet egress or exit. Uh, that uh, Bernie, about the way he'd have to get uh, out. Yes, yes Bob. Well, there's one point on that. The uh, antenna cam is still on this capsule. That antenna can, of course, would have been jettisoned with the drogue chute at the time the main chute came out. Uh, clarification point on that. It's not in his way when he goes to make the egress. That end of the cylindrical section of the spacecraft would be open at this time. Right, this is the, uh, uh, this is the antenna can, and this would have been shot away when the first chute went out. Uh, that's the mechanics of getting out once you're down. Now back to Walter Cronkite at Cape Canaveral. Thank you, Bernie and Bob C. We'll come back to you if uh, the occasion seems to demand. Thank you for your excellent reports through the day. We are simply standing by here with, unfortunately, 
nothing to report. The radio signals still going out hard and strong, attempting to pick up a signal from the capsule, but still nothing from Scott Carpenter since his last transmission that uh, the uh, G-force was building up and that he obviously the cause of that was entering the atmosphere. The point at which his heat shield uh, was to have taken the extreme heat of 15,000 miles an hour through the atmosphere, a heat building to 3,000 degrees, a heat which turns the heat shield, the uh, special fiberglass material of the heat shield into a, uh, actually melts it and drops away from the capsule, but uh, by carrying the heat away in that fashion protects the capsule itself from extreme heat. And inside the capsule, there should be actually no appreciable increase in heat at all. Here comes an announcement from Mercury Control. This is Mercury Control in connection with our efforts to set up best possible search location and recovery operations. We have determined that the guided missile destroyer, Farragut, is also out in that area, not as a part of the Mercury recovery operation, but on its own operation. A message has been sent to the captain of the Farragut, directing him to proceed to the uh, landing point at best possible speed. We do not have confirmation back from the Farragut as yet, but expect to have it shortly. This is Mercury control. Yeah. So there's one other ship being mobilized in this all-out effort to reach. Scott Carpenter and the Aurora 7. The, the Air Rescue Service has more than 48 aircraft in this Atlantic area with special receivers able to pick up a capsule signal from as far out as 60 miles. However, the fact that they indicate that uh, 60 miles is a long distance out to pick up a signal from a capsule shows how it is quite possible for that capsule to be down, safe, the carpenter to be bobbing about in it, and perhaps a slightly rough but uh, not unsafe ride, and still be out of touch uh, with any of the other communications media. We have a very, even more disturbing report, it seems, to this reporter here from NASA, from Space Authority. They say they did not pick up any radar blips from the descending spacecraft. It uh, almost beggars interpretation as to what that could mean. Whether they should have picked up radar blips if the spacecraft is as far as 200 miles away uh, is something that the experts will have to answer, and we're trying to get that answer for you. It uh, seemed to this reporter that they should have. If the Aurora 7 spacecraft came safely through its atmospheric re-entry. Uh, it would, would seem that even 200 miles would not be too far to pick up a radar signal, but perhaps that spacecraft is so small, perhaps the shaft that has to be released is not in that yeah. large a quantity. Uh, but at any rate, no radar signals were received according to the space officials. So there has not even been radar contact with the Aurora 7 uh, since the last contact with uh, Scott Carpenter by voice, which was back when he announced his G-forces building for the re-entry into the atmosphere. As we said, this is the worst tour this reporter ever went through, trying to fill time when there is nothing to say except wait. Among that, uh, I'm sure, a small minority across this nation that uh, doesn't know what happened today. Here's a brief recount. Scott Carpenter in the spacecraft Aurora 7, uh, Mercury spacecraft uh, almost identical to that, which uh, John Glenn flew around the Earth three times on February 20th, a 
Scott Carpenter, 37-year-old lieutenant commander, married, four children, from Boulder, Colorado, took off in that spacecraft from Cape Canaveral here, boosted into orbit by the 360,000-pound thrust, the 7.5 million horsepower of an Atlas rocket. He went into orbit over Bermuda, went through the keyhole in the sky, that bullseye, and uh, thereafter made three orbits to the Earth. There was a time toward the end of the second orbit when uh, Mercury Control seriously discussed bringing him back at the end of two orbits because throughout his flight he had difficulty with the amount of fuel uh, aboard, that fuel which permits him to control the attitude of the aircraft, which is absolutely essential for a safe landing. Apparently that fuel was being used at much too high a rate whenever he undertook maneuvers. As long as he let himself drift or just barely hold himself in position, he didn't use up the fuel, but there was a great deal of concern he wouldn't have enough left for a safe landing. But finally, it was decided to let him go for three orbits. He also had difficulty with his temperature uh, control in his uh, space suit. It zoomed 86 degrees at one time. It's supposed to stand at about 70 degrees. He got it back to that temperature, but two or three times it seemed to go out again. And uh, again, he reported that he was uh, quite warm in the space suit. All those matters apparently had been solved, however, and he was in uh, pretty good shape as he came around to the Earth the third time after 81,000 miles and four and a half hours in space. Uh, he fired his retro rockets on schedule, on uh, the exact schedule uh, predicted for him, uh, so that he would land right in the recovery area, 800 miles southeast of uh, Cape Canaveral. He fired them 100 miles off the coast of California at exactly uh, four hours after uh, takeoff or rather four hours and 33 minutes and 34 seconds after takeoff. He seemed to be making a reasonably normal approach to his re-entry, and then, as was expected, voice communication was lost. Just as he plunged into the atmosphere at a height of some 45 miles, and uh, the temperature went up to 3,000 degrees on the heat shield, he became a flaming meteor in space. Protected, however, by that heat shield, by the insulation inside the craft, which kept the temperature presumably uh, not too uh, uh, excessive for safe re-entry. At uh, that time, radio communication uh, with the capsule was lost, as was expected, because of the ionization that takes place uh, as to the, in the high speed of coming into the atmosphere, seven to 15,000 miles an hour, he hit the atmosphere, began that a burning process by which the heat shield does slowly burn and melt away. But what was odd, peculiar, and scared all of us so much was that radar contact was lost with him at the same time. Simultaneously, radar and voice contact went out, so there was no proof, no proof whatsoever for 46 long minutes that Scott Carpenter and the Aurora 7 had survived re-entry into the atmosphere, the second most dangerous part of the trip, perhaps the first most dangerous part, that and the launch sequence itself. Uh, there was no evidence at all. For 46 minutes we waited. There was no contact with Carpenter. The only prediction we had of where he was was the prediction made while the spacecraft was still in contact, and that was 200 miles uh, overshot beyond the recovery area. Uh, then, 46 minutes after he landed, we got word from a Navy bomber that they had sighted Carpenter in his raft alongside of the capsule, waving to them, sitting upright, apparently all right. On the outboard destroyer, the USS Pierce, the one of the recovery force that was closest to the impact point, let's again hear from Bill Evenson. William Evenson on the USS John R. Pierce. Traveling at flag C-32 knots in the general direction of astronaut Scott Carpenter. A new development that we have just learned. There is a German merchant ship approximately 30 miles from the downed astronaut. And it might be conceivable that the ship would pick up the astronaut at rendezvous with a medical team aboard the USS Pierce. At any rate, all ships are converging as well as helicopters and planes on the area where the downed astronaut is. And the general consensus here aboard the USS Pierce as well as elsewhere is that we hope that whoever gets there first can conceivably make a rescue at this time. This is William Evenson aboard the USS Pierce of the Atlantic Ocean, and we're a little better than 1,000 miles southeast of Cape Canaveral.
Now, so there is a ship just 30 miles away, but uh, considering the speed of a merchant ship, that German ship could very well be three hours away yet. And there are American uh, destroyers, the missile carrier uh, uh, Farragut, which is only another hour away. Let's go back to St. Louis, Missouri now, the McDonald Aircraft Plant and Bernard Eisman. Walter, this is the happy ending that all suspense stories I ever have. Bob C., who's been with us in the capsule all day since Scott Carpenter climbed into his seat, just lived through some of those same very suspenseful and troublesome moments. Bob, uh, you were sort of hoping and wishing along with Scott Carpenter, weren't you? Uh, Bernie, we were concerned. We were confident. And now that we've heard the news, we're probably about the happiest folks in the world. This, uh, Walter, seems to be the reaction all over. Mr. Bernie, Although, Bernie, excuse us, but we got a report from Mercury Control. We'll be right back here. As of this time, there are a number of people, airplanes, and ships en route to the landing area of the Aurora 7 spacecraft and astronaut Scott Carpenter. The SC-54 has been in the area, has deployed its paramedics, and they are in the water with Carpenter. An SA-16 aircraft is an amphibious aircraft, is en route, and it has a water landing capability. Two turbine-powered helicopters have been deployed from the aircraft carrier, the Intrepid. And the destroyer Farragut and the Intrepid are both pointed in that direction and are proceeding at full steam. All of those forces are converging now on the landing area in an effort to assist and recover M. Scott Carpenter. This is Mercury Control. Okay, Bernie Eisman, you heard that report, too, uh, from uh, Shorty Powers, that there are several vehicles of various nature on the way, including an amphibian airplane, but he didn't say uh, how soon or it might reach there or how far away it is. We'll try to get that information. Uh, go back to Bob, would you, and you know, that report? Well, there, well, everyone waited to hear what had happened. The Mercury... McDonald personnel here at St. Louis sat in a little darkened room, just a few feet behind this capsule, and listened to your report and listened to the reports from Mercury Control. And it was a very quiet little room. Then when he got that first report of the aircraft sighting, first just a little audible sigh of relief, laughter, and then a lot of applause. Bob C., what uh, would you imagine? was the problem with radio, uh, if there was a problem. Uh, do you think there was a problem, or was he just out of range? Bernie, I really and truly can't say. The problem, I imagine, is the range situation. But there's one thing for sure, the point you made on the folks in the room listening and waiting for that 46 minutes, uh, I'm sure it was the same all over the nation in the NASA, McDonald's, and our whole country, I think, had a rough 46 minutes, and this happiness, his plane, is deserved of the amount of work that the astronauts and everyone concerned with the project have put in. That work really isn't over either yet, is it, Bob? But if things hold true to former fashion, that capsule number 18 will come right home here to McDonald, where it'll be taken apart and looked over very carefully. Is that so? Well, even before that, there'll be a very, very fine tooth uh, inspection of the spacecraft at the Cape launch site, and the folks down there will ascertain all of the information that only today we have to get. But uh, very quickly, the information will be out, and the NASA will uh, publish a report for, in, I think, a very short time, just as they did on Glenn's flight, which will tell us a lot of these answers that right now we'd like to know, but in the tide of the sighting and knowing that he's on the water, I think all of us are just plain happy to have that much information, Bernie. That's pretty much of an amen from the whole CBS News and McDonald crew here at St. Louis. Now back to Walter Cronkite at Cape Canaveral. Bob Seat, as our CBS News astronaut, our kind of personal, private, exclusive astronaut today, may I uh, thank you on behalf of all of us for your really excellent explanations uh, whenever we could come to you. And since uh, Scott Carpenter, uh, your uh, fearless leader out there in space uh, is 
resting comfortably on a cool raft in the middle of the Atlantic, I think we ought to dismiss you from the cockpit of that uh, uh, mock-up in St. Louis once you get into a tub of water. Don't go too far away, though, because we may have some more explanations we want coming up. <laughs> Fine, Walter. My pleasure. Thanks very much, Bob C. McDonald Aircraft, builders of the capital, St. Louis, Missouri. Well, we'll be back for more live coverage of Scott Carpenter's orbital flight and of his recovery from the Atlantic Ocean after a pause for station identification. For three quarters of an hour this afternoon, the nation's heart stood still. From Cape Canaveral out over the South Atlantic, a message was being radioed over and over again, Aurora 7, Aurora 7, come in, but the message went unanswered, and so did the nation's anxious question about the fate of an astronaut last heard from as he prepared for the risky return to Earth after three worrisome orbits. <laughs> the answer came in a jubilant report from a search plane. The capsule had been sighted in the ocean alongside it in the jaunty words that came from Cape Canaveral, a yellow life raft, and sitting in it was a gentleman named Carpenter. A CBS News Extra of Aurora 7. Well, it started out like uh, Buck Rogers and wound up like a condensed version of Robinson Crusoe. Instead of a recovery, it seemed like a rescue. Tonight, after that national agony of suspense, until he was finally sighted and picked up, the first word from Scott Carpenter is, I feel fine. He's spending the night on Grand Turk Island down in the Caribbean, regular check-in point for astronauts on completing their missions, and the only explanation so far of the landing that went awry is just a speculative one. The reason he overshot the scheduled recovery area by some 250 miles may have been a mechanical fault that delayed the firing of his capsule's retro rockets by just a matter of seconds. After the earlier successes of Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn, Scott Carpenter's mission seemed, in advance, almost routine. Actually, it was our most ambitious challenge yet to the alien environment called space. It required the pilot to do things we hadn't dared ask of his predecessors, a larger degree of control in maneuvering a space capsule, more tests to help measure the way things move in space, and how they looked to a man observing them. It was a mission that ran into a whole series of frets and worries all the way, although it could hardly have started out under more favorable auspices. Before dawn this morning at the launch pad, everything was going uh, more smoothly than on any previous flight. The months of preparation preceding it into its final hours without a hitch. The only cause of minor was a minor one, a minor concern, a slight ground haze hanging over the Cape, partly caused by forest fires. It could hamper the filming of the launch on which space technicians depend for data on how well the vehicle performs its functions. At 5.38 a.m., Scott Carpenter began the elevator ride up the gantry to his waiting capsule. He'd been up since 2.15 this morning. He had breakfast with his colleague, John Glenn, taking his final medical tests, putting on his complex rig of carefully fitted space suit, as you see it there, with the attachments for measuring his every breath and pulse beat, the vital spacesuit that protects the astronaut against the unearthly low pressures and temperatures of space. And that turned out to be one of the major areas of worry during his flight. Now he's on his way. Moving up to the top of the gantry to the green room, an enclosure surrounding the tiny space capsule that will be the astronauts' quarters for the four and a half hours of orbital flight. And as you know, those quarters are cramped indeed.
the astronaut ready, and so is everything else. Still not the slightest sign of any trouble. Everything was go at Cape Canaveral except for that ground haze. And when that cleared up, at 8.45, just 45 minutes behind the optimum launch time, Scott Carpenter was ready for the flight that was to...